of this large report that was created. So we made a plan to engage community organizations who are one of the users of the report to help with content about a health issue that was affecting the community. Um, and community facilitators were a huge link because they had established connections to um, organizations within the community. They were really integral for helping us. Um, as we started to do this community engagement, we ran into some challenges. So uh, COVID-19 was a huge one. Um, it actually really impacted our timelines and it also impacted our staff time because we were getting pulled into COVID-19 work for the health system. Um, two, we had to rethink our approach. Obviously we would have wanted to meet in person and then we were starting to figure out what worked virtually. Um, this was during the first wave, by the way. Um, so three, with new constraints, we couldn't meet the community's expectations or our original expectations in terms of what we wanted to include for content because this timeline really had to change and we had to meet our deadline of um, completing them near the end of this year. We just completed them, so the, it's a huge accomplishment. But in this case, we did have to scale back. Um, we did continue to make the profiles, but we really had to change and rethink our approach. Um, so we had to really consider the expectations of the organizations because we didn't want to spend a lot of time engaging them in the process and then produce something that wasn't actually going to be able to reflect what they reflected what they wanted to see in these reports. And in, in a lot of cases, it was also clear that I don't think we were clear enough on what the reports really were and, and what we were able to do with the information that we had. So we didn't continue to engage in the way that we had planned. Um, and we were very transparent and communicated this change to uh, the community facilitators who are really helping us to set up these meetings. Um, and it's kind of also an interesting example because the overall CHA process is changing. So it's not an example where we can go back and say, hey, the next time we're gonna create these profiles, we're gonna engage community. It's actually a much larger conversation about community engagement moving forward um, that involves people beyond our team. And um, one key point is that we really recognize the need to engage people much earlier in the process um, moving forward. So an example of this could be having an opportunity to identify health indicators um, that are really important to a neighborhood or community in Winnipeg before information gets published, for example. So yeah, it, it's kind of a, it's not like a super positive engagement story, but we learned a lot from, from the experience. I'll jump in here as well. So uh, most of my experiences as a patient partner or parent partner. So most of the challenges I have faced are around communication and expectations. I have had papers and grants go in with my name on them that I never saw before they were submitted. I've been told I wouldn't understand. I've been asked to prove that I shared recruitment materials with a certain number of people when I didn't know that was part of the recruitment plan. So all of it came down to expectations and communication. So at the beginning of a research project, if you clearly and jointly come up with those expectations and shared proposed timelines, if you have them, that's a really good start. I mean, maybe once the project is funded, I guess. <laughs> and then refer back to these every, once every six months or so, or when the phase of research changes. Because if you come back to those same documents around shared expectations, it helps remind everyone collectively. So one project I worked on, the group of parents asked for updates every two months, um, even if nothing was happening. And that was just so that we would know we weren't supposed to be doing something and had missed it, because that does happen. Uh, this was forgotten as the recruitment phase dragged on and on. And on our six months check-in with the documents, the, um, the coordinator realized this right away and apologized and started getting back into it. So it wasn't something we had to bring up. It was just by going back to those expectations, it sort of happened. Um, another strategy we, we have implemented in, a, in other projects was that someone on the research team reach out to each partner individually just once a year to check in. 
So this can help contextualize where that family is at. Like my kid's been in the hospital for the past two months. So that's where I've, why I've been off the radar. Um, or make sure that the current ways of engaging are working. You can keep notes on how each person likes to be contacted um, so and reminded of things like text or email or a phone call. And you'd be amazed at how many of your patient or parent partners will invite you to send them a text if they haven't responded to something that you really need them to. So it's a good way to just keep that engagement going. Thank you, both Leanne and Carrie. It sounds like a lot of both with your themes is communication and expectations is such an important part to not only lay out at the beginning, but an ongoing conversation and putting in place some strategies to make sure that you are connecting back to it all the time. That's wonderful. I guess from your perspective, what are some areas in need of improvement and engagement and what kind of strategies would be helpful for making change? Um, what kind of changes need to happen and who needs to be involved? Uh, for this one, maybe Sarah? Sure, okay, well, I'll give a response to that from the my perspective, which is again, working more in health systems performance and quality improvement. So not, not so much engaging patients and people with lived experience in research, but more in that health systems change. Really, I feel that um, while we, we, there are examples of where we've done this very well, just generally there's a, a reluctance among healthcare providers, maybe in health, health systems leaders who might think this type of decision needs to be made by people with professional experience. Um, we tend to work in interprofessional teams, but don't always have patients on, on that, that team. Or we think um, we have a fear of uh, that, en uh, that engaging patients in decision making requires additional time and resources that uh, that's difficult in an already pressured care environment. Um, and so there's that mis misunderstanding of that. Um, and then when we do involve patients, sometimes we limit those to tasks such as reviewing education material um, rather than providing input. Um, on the processes and delivery of care or um, being involved sort of a, as partners from the beginning. So in my experience, I, like I said, I have seen this done well and there are examples where we do it well. And so what I've really seen as helping, I think what you're saying, Carolyn, to, um, to facilitate the, the, that change or help with the improvement has been, um, first of all, having champions or leaders, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a leader being a leader, but it could be anybody le leading that, like having that passion for it and bringing, bringing that concept forward. Um, and related to that are examples of success. So when there are examples of success, um, either locally or otherwise, it, it helps people to see how it can be done and that it, it isn't um, a, a process that may be as time consuming or resource dependent as people think it is. And then related to that point is having those resources and being able to guide people to where they are. And that's where I found the resources at CHI extremely helpful. Um, it can help just get, get people started um, where they not sure how to start or, or what, what to, what to do. And then the other Part from my perspective and experience so far has been I've really found it helpful sometimes to have a trained facilitator, especially in um, in the work in quality improvement. We often have um, like advisory groups or a group of people, and it's sometimes easier to have a facilitator help out with a few of those initial meetings, bring some, you know, uh, sort of work together with everybody all together so you're not uh, feeling like you're trying to engage patients but also lead something at the same time. So I found that very helpful and CHI does have some good resources with facilitating. So I think that's my response to that question. I'm gonna go, go, go on that, which is in many ways, I do think there's so much information out there, maybe too much. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> um, and that information can be not easily findable or sortable, sortable, or it can be very overwhelming for someone trying to do it. Um, much of the information, in much of that information, patient engagement can come across as time consuming, expensive and complicated, like Sarah was saying. And that can be really hard to sign up for, especially in the research world when everyone's already overworked and juggling too many projects anyway. Patient engagement can be all of those things. 
but at its core, it's also fun. It keeps patients the why front of mind as well as makes the work we do more meaningful for the people we are researching in the long run. I think sometimes in trying to share information and do it right, we forget simple ideas. Patient partners are colleagues who happen to have lived experience. We aren't different, we aren't complicated, we are just people who sometimes have complicated lives because of a particular disease or circumstance. In my case, uh, before I had this job, I was squeezing in this work while simultaneously doing a puzzle with one child and helping my six-year-old with fractions, because yes, my six-year-old loves fractions. Who knew? Um, anyway, but you know what made those experiences great? We're really good facilitators. So going back to what, um, what Sarah said is make sure that someone in your project wants to listen to those stories and has the time to do it. Um, because if you aren't excited about it, that's okay. Make sure your study coordinator does or someone else on your team has those skills or reach out to any one of us and we can help you for those first few meetings to get things started in the right direction. Because if the person supporting patient engagement doesn't want to be there or doesn't have the time to be there, the experience is not going to be great for anyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Carrie. That's a really, really important reminder. I think a lot of times, a lot of times we forget about that relationship part, that fun part, and the importance of having someone to help facilitate those, those interactions as well. Um, who has the time to build and 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 take the time to do that? That's um, thank you so much, both Sarah and Carrie. Um, for the next question. What has helped or facilitated engagement in your experience, whether it's doing patient engagement or public engagement or championing it within your organization or team, what or who makes it easier? Um, so for our team, um, it's not always this clean cut approach, but um, we've actually developed standard questions around public and patient engagement when we do consults or develop a proposal for a plan on an evaluation. Um, so even if it doesn't happen, it's something that we've talked about and it's something that at the very least has been considered with them. Uh, so it's become part of that process. Um, and our team's gotten creative with engagement depending on the context. So. Sometimes it's far from looking like a textbook example, but just as an example, um, a colleague and, my, and mine are um, evaluating a very new program right now. And uh, we asked the project leads if there was interest or an opportunity to have people of lived experience be involved with our evaluation process. Um, so their suggestion at this stage in their program was to actually involve a few key members of their team who work as staff because they were actually hired based on the fact that they do actually come with um, similar lived experience. So they've been brought onto the team to help um, look at some of our questions and our process and they've been really instrumental at, in helping us think through why we're asking or what we're asking. Um, so that's been kind of maybe a, an off approach, but it's worked really well. Um, and I would say what makes it better, I mean, it's been talked about already, but really having team members that, um, or, or clients who are very receptive. Um, so it does require a certain element of buy-in. And I have noticed a lot more on the qualitative research side than the quantitative research side or the health system side, just because it's it's not so far of a stretch. Um, you're already engaging with people on the qualitative end of it. It's just seen it more as a partnership versus your participant in a study. Um, you know, it, it's a lot more important to have that buy-in than just see it as an expectation because the funder suddenly wants it for a grant. Um, and of course, resources are, are enablers. So having um, resources in terms of time, to, time and money does, does absolutely factor in. 
I'm going to jump in just quick with a story um, based on that, like the funder requiring it on a grant application. So this is a story about the city of Fredericton. Bear with me. Um, so they created a municipal arts policy in order to rationalize city ser services within respect to the arts. So when the manhole covers needed to be replaced, a civil servant thought of reaching out to a local artist to design them for the first time. So if you go to Fredericton, check out the manhole covers. But now just to be clear, not every municipal project had to have an arts component, but because of this policy, it was always considered. Patient engagement should be the same. And I think that's what they're trying to do with those funding applications. In every research project, it should be considered. Yeah. I can further to that, like uh, my roles and the platform they're working is about the data. As a PE champions, I always get the questions about data security, how you guys using the data, how you guys sharing the data, what the policy around it. And I found that the data that we use in the health research related to people's life. However, people with the lived experience and member of the public may feel disconnected from such information about them as they cannot usually see it or do not know what is related, related to our, or how it's stored or how it's using it. So in my opinion is the patient public engagement is important piece to bridge the gap between the data scientists and the people to whom the data relates to as well as increase the public awareness of the data that they are collected or in, and engage people to be involved about how the data are used or shared to the public. So as a PA champions, like I, I was experienced and um, been into the a grant reviewer and I found that five key elements that are essential for overall uh, patient engagement strategy. So number one is, have clarity of purpose. Giving the diversity of the purpose of explicit statement about the purpose are required and it should be updated during the process of engagement. And clarity of the purpose is essential in order to set a appropriate and realistic expectation between the uh, member of the public as well as a researcher and select a suitable approach to proceed in the project. And the second, as uh, our panel has been uh, discussed about it all along, is about be transparent. Within the research team, the patient engagements uh, should be conducted with a high level of transparency in both research works, as well as the, lead, uh, the process during conducting that research project. It should to be uh, freely communicate between both sides. And the third one is about involve uh, two-way communications because this communication will help the member of the public to be active contributor in the research project and the process. It's okay that disagreement or diversity, of, I think somebody's tried to avoid of disagreement, but you know, diversity and disagreement are the positive features that are essential for the constructive discussion. It's okay to have it as long as the, we communicate like, with, with um, appropriate reason and with a well manner. And the fourth one is to be inclusive and accessible to the broad publics. Member of the public and people with deep experience are competent deliberators who have variable experience and insight relevant to the project. Incorporating perspective from them adds real value and substantially improve the research process and the outcome. So the research team should consider about adapt their language and the format of event to ensure accessibility. All the activity for the patient engagement should be created to make the most of engaged opportunities offered to be freely and fully articulated their views. And patient engagement should be facilitated the participation of diverse group and interests. So this is one of the key. And the last one, be ongoing. 
patient and public engagement should be a part of an ongoing strategy rather than relying on one-off events. This should be start early on in the development of the research. Planning together for the other relevant uh, activity, uh, the patient engagement strategy should lead the way in informing the research as they evolve in order to ensure they are guided by the public value and interest. So this is um, based on my experience, I think that there are a five key that I would like to share with all of you. Yeah. Can I just add something in there? Because I was thinking of something that Leanne said and Wadaman said about how this can sometimes be harder when we're looking at data or quantitative data. And just, this is not my quote, but a quote I heard, I think it's out of British Columbia, but at the heart of every data point in healthcare is a person. And that's just uh, really important to remember. And even though it's harder, you know, the patient experience with the healthcare system um, is, is an important thing to consider. And they, that it's important information that we need to incorporate into um, everything we do, whether it's quantitative research or health system improvement. And um, I know Waterman and I've talked about this a little bit before, but so, some of those data points include patient reported outcomes and experiences. And that's something that everyone who works with me knows that I'm working really hard to integrate more into our healthcare system um, and the way we measure it um, and making sure that that data point is, is included in the way we measure things. Uh, that's not really answering the question because I don't feel I can really contribute a lot more than what everyone has said and what I've already said, which is just reiterating this importance of having strong leaders, um, clear expectations and roles, as Wadaman said, um, strategies and resources to build a culture of patient engagement. So shifting that culture. And again, I think that's what Carrie kind of said about, you know, this has to be something we think about always doing. Like it's, it's just something that's always considered in the work going forward, whether that's research or what we're doing in our health system. Oh my goodness, you guys all gave such wonderful answers and such great tips, I think, for our audience today. Um, some really good takeaways. We're going to now give everyone else in our audience a chance to discuss as well. Um, so uh, Liza, who's with us, is going to start setting up breakout rooms for us. And we're going to split everyone into four groups. And each of our champions, so each of our panelists today, are going to help facilitate a discussion for about 15 minutes. And in the registration process on Eventbrite, we asked everyone to share up to three opportunities for improvement in patient engagement. And we asked for, oh, and we asked for opportunities instead of challenges because we really want to ground the discussion in a strengths-based way around resilience and to think about the positives of challenges and obstacles and how we can learn from them and work together to find solutions. Uh, so in each of your groups, feel free to chat about challenges you may have faced uh, in engagement. But for um, each challenge, think about also asking, um, sharing what you learned from it. And if you're able, uh, please also share with your group some of your successful strategies or resources you found really helpful um, in addressing challenges and making positive change in your engagement work. Um, so I am going to actually just uh, share the screen again with our PowerPoint. Um, sorry, bear with me there. <laughs> Ah, uh, technology. Um, and I'm just going to bring up our questions for the discussion group. Okay, let's see. There we go. So those are the questions. The questions are, uh, what challenges are, or what are some key challenges you faced in engagement and what did they teach you? Uh, what strategies or resources did you, or would you find useful uh, to address these challenges? So our champions are gonna help facilitate the discussion and look for common themes and as well um, as well some of the members of the PE team. And then after about, we'll give you 15 minutes, we'll come back together as a group and share some of the insight that was talked about in our groups. And please feel free to participate in whatever way you feel comfortable. So whether that be with video, voice only, or even in the chat box, that's all right. Um, and we'll now change our security setup 
setting settings so um, you can unmute yourself. And Liza, uh, you can start uh, putting people into breakout rooms. Welcome back, everyone. I know there's a lot of good conversation and some of, the, some of the conversation got cut off there a little bit. Sorry about that. There's so much to so much to cover. Um, I, I hope you found that the time was enough and had some good discussion. Um, I'm going to put up the slide. Oh, right. I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry, bear with me. Um, this was what I think you had some quite everyone had a question when they first um, first joined um, around uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, and this is kind of what was summarized. It looked like there was a lot of personal and practical and skill and resource side of things. So relationship, trust, respect, communication, sharing knowledge, honesty and transparency, uh, patient-centered approach, role clarity, consistency and regularity, evaluation, and then on the skills and resources uh, side, supportive funding, trauma-informed approaches, facilitation skills, active listening, framework for engagement, uh, knowledge of resources and best practices. So this is kind of what we got from you guys when you were registering as some of the key challenges and opportunities. Um, I'm going to ask that the facilitators for the group share a few sentences from each group, um, just summarizing some of the, the discussion that you had in your group. Challenges faced, lessons learned, resources or supports. Um, maybe I'll start with Carrie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we had interesting discussion because we had it from both sides that both researchers um, um, we had from both researchers and the parents um, who wanted to actually be involved in research and didn't know where to go to find that opportunity. So the researcher side was sort of like, how do we create meaningful, um, how do we create these relationships to be meaningful? Um, and Andrew, thank you for sharing uh, the rest of your comment in the chat. We ended up cutting off Andrew in the middle, unfortunately, but it is true. It's how do we make that meaningful instead of just a checkbox like a focus group. Um, but on the other side, it's there's people who are interested and want to do it on the patient side and aren't sort of don't have a way in. There's no way for them to say, hey, I want to do this and then be connected to a researcher. So that's sort of what we were talking about. And, and there are some things that are happening. Sky is starting a, a sort of a checkbox that you can say, yes, I want to be involved in research. Um, you know, um, so there are some health centers that are starting to do that. So hopefully things like that can happen. A centralized system, who knows? All right, I'll pass it off to, to Sarah, maybe. Sure, okay, I'll try to go uh, quickly. We had a lot of great feedback, um, starting off with funding and the importance of uh, building that in early, but also the real challenge in the more health system side of stuff where often this isn't funded and it's sort of expected to just, I don't know, vol patients volunteer their time or it's supposed to just happen. So really changing a culture around that. We also talked about when you have patients around the table, it's important to have more than one. And there's a lot of reasons why um, you need to do that. I mean, first of all, it's a lot of pressure on one person and that might be a person living with an illness um, and, and it does not uh, allow for diversity. Um, we have some challenges in making sure that, uh, and related to that, that we do have diverse people around the table. So people who may, who may be underserved, uh, how do we reach them? It's even more difficult now during COVID. So finding creative ways to do that. Um, uh, let's see. And one other comment I'll just say that I really thought was important was um, from, uh, from uh, somebody who is a patient partner who talked about the communication, uh, an importance of a communication getting out there to people and patients so that they understand how important their input is. Um, and, and that that's a real communication piece that we need to make sure we focus on. That's all. Um, Leanne, were you one of the, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so a key theme that kind of came up was actually around um, the, the need or the, the want to have um, like a, a database of public and patient partners who have an interest in being involved in a variety of ways. Um, we kind of talked about it a little bit on the research side, a lot on the health system side. Um, I believe Shauna mentioned that in an environmental scan, the BC um, 
Patient Voices Network was an example of something established in their healthcare system. Um, and so it was not just around the expectations of um, patient and public partners, but it was creating an actual process to do this so that you're not expected to do it ad hoc for a project when you know you don't have the time in the project or the resources, it's something um, more standard to help with the, the process so that people can be involved when the opportunities come up. Thanks so much, Leanne. And then I think Wadaman or Ogai. Hmm, we might be missing one of our groups. Um, they just decided to keep chatting. <laughs> yeah, maybe they overrode the. Uh, um, that, thank you so much for all of those pieces that you that everyone just shared. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much. Very helpful. I just wanted to check our chat box. Uh, Kathy uh, mentioned that at Can Solve CKD, they provide training for all of their partners um, around research processes uh, like the 101, as well as storytelling as part of their SPORE core training. So that's good to know. Um, definitely. Um, and those are things that we can put together. I think we were hoping to put together a little reference list to send all of our participants today of different resources and tools that they might um, find helpful as they navigate things. So we will uh, make sure to send you guys all, uh, um, all of these different options. Um, one last thing. So I wanted to just thank everyone today for joining us and taking the time to share all of your knowledge and your experience and your insights. Um, I hope this conversation has been helpful uh, and that we can continue to have these conversations and learn and grow from one another um, and, and find truly meaningful ways uh, and strategies and relationships for engagement in health research and beyond. And based on your input and discussions, today we'll send a resource list um, to everyone and if you have any resources or sh to share definitely feel free to send us um, uh, a suggestion as well we can set we will send out an email to contact where you can contact us and also just a quick quick reminder um, that um, that we next uh, lunchtime learning session will be March 10th and it will feature Dylan McKay. Um, he's a previous award winner of ours um, who won one of our Preparing for Research by Engaging Patients and Public Partners award and he's going to share his experiences around engaging in the early stages of planning a clinical trial. Um, so you can find more information on our website and we'll also send the link as well uh, to for people today. Um, I once again Again, thank you so much to our panelists, to everyone who attended, and um, thank you, thank you for attending. And we can't wait to continue to connect. And please feel free to come to our next one as well. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>